All right, back with David Barton. I want to go to the total executive orders. And if you look up on the chalkboard, you'll see um, Adams had one. Jefferson had four, Madison one, Monroe one. I mean, that's amazing. Washington had eight. Mm -hmm. um, and then th what's incredible to me is after Washington, it went all the way down to Andrew Jackson. People were restrained compared to him. No, they, didn't, yep. they always get worse. Yeah, that's they right. got better. Yeah. Okay. So, but if you look at here, you go Harrison had nothing. First of all, let's go to Jackson because... He had the Indian, Indian he had the removal. Indian Wars, um, and I think, I think personally, that's where our country changed. Our country really began to change around 1830. Um, and then you go down and you see that it's 17, 18, 12, 35 with Pierce, 16, 48 with Lincoln, 79 with Johnson, and then you see Grant, 217. Mm -hmm. that's, that had to cause some turmoil, I mean, if people were aware of it back then. That had to have people say, whoa, 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 what, you power-hungry dictator. Yeah. There's, there's several things going with Grant. One is Reconstruction. So we got Reconstruction going, and you've got all these states that have come back into the United States, and so you're issuing executive orders on how to govern those states because they're not officially accepted back in yet. They have to go through the amnesty oath and everything else. So it's like having federal territories. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the first term executive order is, is credited with the Abraham Lincoln order on um, October the 20th, 1862, where he gave an executive order for the establishment of a provisional court in Louisiana. So they're governing the southern states, and that's a lot of it. ADD moment, if I could just get a real quick ruling on this one. Grant is known as one of the most corrupt administrations in mm -hmm. history, right? Yeah. Was he corrupt, or was his administration Don't think corrupt? he's corrupt. I think he, he was a great military guy, not a great civil administrator. And okay. he's surrounded with military guys who have a lot more honor and integrity than the guys around him in, in office. Okay. I think he got used in a lot of ways. So then you go down, Garfield it comes, brings it back down yep. to, to only six. Um, Cleveland, 113. But then you get to um, Theodore Roosevelt, I think, is the next really big one, right? Yeah. Yeah. 1,000 executive orders. 1,081. Now, uh, Roosevelt, it's actually in that time frame of 1907 that they started numbering executive orders. You got so many of these things that you got to number them. So you, you look at, and, and choose all your favorite progressive presidents. You know, you, you choose. I have no favorite progressive. Well, all, all the ones you like to be. That's yeah, right. Okay. Uh, it, it's going to be Roosevelt. It, it's going to be um, Wilson. Wilson. It's going to be FDR. And look at the numbers of executive orders from these guys, your activist guys, as opposed to your other guys. Now, the, the, one, the one that stands in stark contrast to that is Calvin Coolidge. Let's just put this in perspective. Nobody had broken 1,000 until Roosevelt, and then Taft does 700, and then Wilson, 1,800. Yep. Then Harding, who is short-lived, 522, and then Coolidge at 1200. Yeah. And Coolidge is Ronald Reagan's favorite president. Yep. I believe Am Amity Schlage is going to be on. She's doing a Coolidge hour with me. I believe Coolidge is probably, could be wrong, love to hear your opinion on this, probably the best president of the 20th century and maybe the, the president of the 20th century that is definitely the best that nobody knows. Well, that's absolutely the case. I think he's one of the best presidents, period, in the 20th century. He didn't have the crisis type stuff. Well, he did economically and yeah. he solved it right, but he didn't have the visible crisis of World War One or two or whatever. Right, but he had the in. he had the biggest the he had a bigger depression. That's right. Than, than that's 1929. Right. And he handled that. And what's interesting about his number of executive orders is, unlike other presidents, you don't find controversial orders in there. It's not like the the, the Indian removal. It's not like the FDR stuff. It, it, How it's much different? What was the percentage? Because what Coolidge did, which I think was so amazing, is you had a nation that everybody was going progressive. Yeah. They started seeing yeah. eugenics and everything else. They started to see this brand new world. Yeah. Everything's old and outdated. That world doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore. Pretty much what we're in right now. Mm -hmm. That brand new world. And so he had, they started saying redistribution of wealth, all these Marxist things. Because right. they didn't have the death um, associated to them as we know now. That's right. And so it was easier to latch onto these things. And so what made Coolidge so great was he had to actually convince people that no, These hard are bad work, ideas. merit, yeah, no right. redistribution of wealth. 
How, what was the percentage of his executive orders that rescinded? I don't know the exact percentage, but it was a high number. You take Teddy Roosevelt, who come in, came in and took all sorts of private lands to make national parks, natural monuments, national forests. Those were not voted? Oh, no. That, that was executive order stuff. And so what happened, now Congress approved things afterwards, but a lot was done by executive, executive order. If I'm a president, can I issue an executive order to sell the national parks? Um, yes, because you have the Department of Interior now. Very, very likely wow. Congress is going to get involved. But see, this is where President Clinton issued the, uh, the American, what was it? The, Rivers. No, not on the Rivers. That was before. In 2001, the Land Conservation Act, anyway, it seized, it, it took and federalized land in 38 states and made 60 million acres under jurisdiction, executive order. 60 million acres in 38 states. So, yeah, taking land. So what Coolidge did was he gave a whole bunch of that land back. That, F, that Teddy had, had taken for federal government. He said, no, 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 this is private land. This is not so federal government. So all of that, uh, what are they doing it for, wild horse land or whatever it is? That yeah. when, when, remember when Obama first got yes. in and he took all of that land? Mm -hmm. uh, so the next president can just say, no, no, no all that land goes back to the Can States. reverse that, okay. yeah. All right, so... Um, and by the way, there's a lot of examples where presidents do reverse previous executive orders. You know, just take the simple one with abortion, Mexico City policy. In 84, Ronald Reagan said, we're not going to use State Department funds to help fund abortions overseas. What was the biggest overturn of any executive order, either by the following president or Congress? The, probably one of the, well, one that a president overturned himself is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton issued an executive order that rescinded the executive order of both Bush 41 and Reagan that said we're going to observe the Tenth Amendment. We in the federal government are not going to take state functions, and you will look at the Tenth Amendment when you do policy. Clinton rescinded that order, said don't look at the Tenth Amendment, just do policy. And he got such pushback, even wow. from Democrat governors and Democrat states, that about a year later he rescinded his own executive order. He said, oh, let's, let's put the Tenth Amendment back in the Constitution. So there you have a president. How can a president... How can a president say we're not going to, well, I guess this one is. We're back we're to not John Francis to, yeah. Mercer. It's the interest they have in maintaining the Constitution that will govern us. It's not the Constitution that governs us. It's the people we put in office and whether they uphold the Constitution. And so he has no respect for it, so he's going to run over. He doesn't like the Tenth Amendment. And nobody, in, and nobody in Congress, and, and as long as Congress doesn't push back, he can just keep taking and taking and taking, which makes right. them, in the end, completely irrelevant. And, which makes us irrelevant, too, as people. Hi hypothetical, yeah. A hypothetical situation. Um, could a president say, you know what, um, in peacetime, uh, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't have to listen anymore to Congress. I'm going to keep them. They'll keep their jobs and everything else, but I'm just going to make them completely irrelevant. Could he... Could he, in theory, do that? I thought that that's what he's doing. Yeah, well, I, I know, but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, actually, spell it out. And if it, Congress didn't say anything because they kept their jobs and everything else, and they, you know, they were nice uh, decoration, mm -hmm. which they are quickly becoming, and the American people didn't say anything, could he make himself? Could there, he just declare himself dictator if nobody pushed back? There are in the Federalist Papers. Alexander Hamilton has a great phrase. He he says that, that the Constitution has given each branch what he called constitutional arms of self-defense. If you refuse to pick up an arm of self-defense and use it, you're going to get run over by your enemy. That's when I say you have a right, but you also have a responsibility, responsibility. That's exactly to defend right. yourself. And, and so, theoretically, they could do that. Now, I will point out that, that um, in, in the case of Harry Truman, he used an executive order to seize all steel plants in the United States. Korean okay. War, he seized. Hang on just a second. Right. Let's, let's go right there when we come back.